the panel that, w that we put together today is sort of, uh, you know, we have a, a bunch of questions that we're going to ask, and we'll have everybody up here discuss some of those questions. And then towards the end, um, we want to leave some time for your questions, because I know you have, you know, a lot of questions, but you're here, so you're interested in, the, in, the th in this uh, topic. So, with that, uh, here's the panel. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Michael Shear. Uh, I go by the Prez 98, and I own my own small business, and I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, all the way to your right is Abigail Phillips from the F uh, EFF. Uh, I'm, a, thank you. I'm a staff attorney at the EFF, um, where I focus on online content issues. Those are mostly around copyright, but uh, net neutrality kind of fits in there too. Uh, next to her is Todd Kimball. Uh, hi, everyone. I am uh, basically a small business infrastructure geek and kind of playing the role of the old guy who's been on the internet for a while and asking how things have changed and why is this different than 1994. And next to Todd is our DEF CON virgin, <laughs> Deborah. Hi, I'm, and this is really loud. Does that work? Hi, I'm Deborah Salons. Um, I'm at D Salons on Twitter. I'm a telecommunications attorney in Washington, D.C., and my practice is primarily regulatory in front of the FCC. Um, I'm supposed to give you all this disclaimer that um, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, and I'm here to give you uh, legal information, not legal advice. And the opinions that I'm expressing today are my opinions and not the opinions of my firm or the firm's clients. Thanks. And this is her first Sorry. FCON, so everybody give it a And it's my first FCON. <laughs> <laughs> and my first panel. <laughs> first everything. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk, what do we want to talk about here is when I started looking into this issue of net, net neutrality a year or two ago, um, I, first thing I want, you know, you see all these people on YouTube videos, I support net neutrality or I oppose net neutrality. And I couldn't really find, well, what is net neutrality? And it turns out that that's not, it's, it's, it's easier to ask the question than to answer it because, um, you know, we can break it down to a very simple uh, statement. Uh, say all bits are, are equal. And I think most people would say, okay, that's a reasonable definition of net neutrality. And that's net neutrality from a sort of you know, philosophical standpoint. But how do we put that into practice? And putting that into practice is, is one of the problems that we've run across. And then secondly, why, should we, why you should care about this issue. So, I want to show you a little bit of the FUD that's been out there over the past couple of years. Okay, so this is what, the one I talked about. This is the net neutrality, all bits are created equal. And this is the, sort of the, 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 the most basic thing that you can say about net neutrality and that, that content should be treated equally, okay? I think most people can agree with that on a general concept. Then we have save the internet, save the world. And now we're kind of getting into this like, well, you know, Really? Like, if we don't do this, the world's going to end, or what? What's going on here? Um, we have uh, advertisements where companies are, you know, advertising p different plans at different levels of content at different prices. And then we have headlines. Some people have said, if we adopt net neutrality, it will be the end of the internet as we know it. And some people have said, if we don't adopt, adopt net neutrality, it will be the end of the internet as we know it. And then we have the most extreme case. This woman is named Tanya Devereaux, and she ran for office in Belgium, and she said she would take the virginity of anybody who supported net neutrality. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> we do have the virgin here. <laughs> so this is sort of what we're dealing with. Net neutrality, well, what is it? It's all of this or is it none of this? So what we want to talk about is, let's, let's, let's start off, let's, let's kind of go through each panelist and, and say, well, what is net neutrality? What is it to you from a sort of philosophical standpoint? And then what is it from a, you know, an actual regulatory standpoint? Anyway, anyone? Well, I, I mean, I can give one thought. I mean, to, to me, net neutrality is really about consumers being able to access the content that they want on the devices that they want. And when I say content, I also mean services, applications, content, um, so uh, what, whatever that vehicle is. That doesn't mean to me that 
consumers sh might not pay more for more bandwidth, but it does mean that they don't have to pay more, say, to be able to get access to YouTube, as opposed to not having to pay at all to get access to some other video service. Uh, in my mind, net neutrality is, you know, kind of at the high level of just, um, you know, at each end, not being... Oh, sorry. Uh, my concept is just not being double billed for stuff. You know, if you're paying for internet access, either as a consumer or a corporation, or you're paying for that bandwidth at one end, um, you shouldn't be charged for it at the other end. Okay, and um, for the definition of net neutrality for me, um, I thought this was actually a really interesting question when you posed it to the group, because net neutrality means different things to different people. Um, so I was doing a little bit of research on the internet, and the definition that I felt most comfortable with was no restrictions by ISPs or government on consumers' access to networks that participate on the internet. And for me, as a practitioner, um, especially an FCC practitioner, when the open internet rules came out, people are calling them the net neutrality regulations, and to me that's very ironic. Um, when you look at it, uh, and we'll get in more into that later in the panel, but those, those regulations um, are actually promoting net neutrality, but when you take a step back, you're like, wait a minute, the government is actually getting involved, and this is the first time the FCC is actually, you know, well, they've, they've been attempting this, but it's one of the first steps that the FCC is trying to regulate the internet. So to me, um, I know it means different things to different people, but I think it's, it's, uh, no, it's no restrictions by ISPs or by the government. Absolutely. I think one of the interesting things about net neutrality is, is um, this community, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, I don't, I, I don't want to put labels on, on the community as large, but this community is, is generally libertarian in the fact that we're skeptical of the government, we're skeptical of government actions, we're skeptical of, of government overreach, um, yet when we, how many, let, let me backtrack. How many of you think in principle, not necessarily in practice, how many of you think in principle that treating traffic equally is a good idea? Net neutrality in general is a good idea. Okay, most of you, and I think, how many of you trust the government to enforce it? <laughs> okay, so this, this is what I'm getting at. We, we're, we have a principle that we mostly all agree with but we want the government, maybe or maybe not, we want the government to enforce neutrality, and I don't know if that's a good idea. I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just sort of posing questions. So, right, so, and his, so his comment was, do you trust the government more than the ISPs? Because they may not want to enforce net neutrality. And we'll get into that. So let me get a little, let me give you a little background on the first, so, so that's, Let's wrap up the first section. There is no agreed upon definition of what net neutrality is. Comcast and Verizon will tell you something then that the FCC commissioners will have a different definition than you or me or anyone else up here. So net neutrality is a concept, but in practice, what does that mean? For example, do you want ISP, your ISP to block spam for you? Well, is that a net neutrality violation? I don't know. We'll talk about stuff like that later. So this, in this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the government and the FCC and uh, enforce, sort of enforcing net neutrality. So um, back in about 2007, uh, the, or 2000, yeah, 2007, the government and, and, uh, or the FCC enacted some FC, uh, net neutrality guidelines. And how many of you remember the issue where Comcast was caught throttling BitTorrent traffic? Most people remember that, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah. So um, the FCC um, uh, took Comcast to court, and um, it turned out that the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said to the FCC that your guidelines, you don't have the power to enforce them because Congress has never given you the authority. So what we're talking about here is an issue of Congress giving an executive branch agency the authority to do something, which they, they had not done at that point. So while Comcast violated the FCC guidelines, those, the court said the, the FCC didn't have the power to enact those. And that's sort of the environment we're in now as a post-Comcast where the FCC's authority is not really clear. 
Since then, last December, the FCC has enacted a new set of uh, net neutrality regulations, and some people are questioning, do they actually have the authority to do that? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, the FCC's authority to regulate the internet in general, and where might they find authority to regulate uh, in net neutrality regulations? Well, I'll, I, I mean, I will, I will say um, uh, the FCC, in, it, in its most recent order that it issued December 23rd last year, um, they claimed they claimed authority to regulate using a very similar theory. I mean, it's the the legal underpinnings are sort of arcane, but um, a very similar theory to the same one that was rejected by the D.C. Circuit earlier. Mm -hmm. So it seems pretty unlikely that the court, because it's the, the order is sure to be challenged. Um, in fact, it already has been, but then the court found that that challenge was premature. Um, it's sure to be overturned again. Uh, it does not seem like the FCC is going to successfully find authority under the Communications Act as it exists using the kind of theory that they're using, which is that it's not regu uh, the internet is not regulated as a common carrier under Title II, but rather through ancillary jurisdiction. And that's jurisdiction that Congress has given the FCC to regulate anything that's sort of related to other, other things that it has definite authority to regulate under the Telecommunications Act. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to bring in the uh English side of all of that. Um, the FCC is involved with this for those of you who, you know, might be kind of new to this internet thing, you know, past 10 or 15 years. Uh, the FCC is involved because the internet branched out from, you know, shared networks 40 years ago that were all, you know, on AT&T. This was all telco territory. So for years and years, any internet traffic long before there was a web was effectively regulated by the FCC because it's all on these public utility lines and things shifted in the 80s when AT&T was broken up and now that we have providers like Comcast coming in and you know Google owning all this dark fiber so it's different from the old telco lines as well as all the wireless stuff um, that's you know one of the things that makes this problem different than maybe things were in 95 when the web started and we saw a similar sort of kind of restrictions on how you access data. Yeah, um, I want to piggyback on some of the stuff that Abigail said. Um, what the FCC is claiming for their jurisdiction is ancillary jurisdiction and it, it sounds like a lot of legal ease, but just to kind of give you the background on this, um, Congress, well, opponents of the, the open internet order would say that Congress hasn't given FCC express direct authority over the internet. So to give you an example, in the Communications Act, Title II is on telecommunications services, Title III is on broadcast and wireless, and Title IV is on cable. There's no title for internet, and the internet hasn't been classified as a telecommunications service. So there hasn't been any direct mandate from Congress saying, yes, you can go ahead and regulate this. What ancillary jurisdiction is, is um, an overarching statement, as Abigail said, in the Communications Act that basically says um, the FCC may perform all acts, make such rules and regulations and issue orders not inconsistent with this chapter and may be necessary in the execution or functions. So it's just an overarching thing saying, you know, um, Congress might tell you to regulate telecommunications, but you have a little bit more leeway than exactly what, that, what Congress says. But they're taking it a little too far, at least that's my opinion, and I think that's the opinion of most people. So I think what you're hearing, what you sort of, I, and I think we kind of all agree, may agree on this, that, that whether you support net neutrality regulations or not, the concern, at least among the panelists, and, and, and I would say myself, is that uh, maybe the process is, is not working out so well. In other words, as an executive branch agency, the FCC can only do what it's authorized to do by law. And even people in Congress, many people in Congress who support net neutrality, are telling the FCC, maybe you need to back off a little bit because we haven't given you the authority to regulate that. So I think that's a, concern, a process concern in terms of in terms of what uh, the FCC is doing. Actually, can I add one other thought? I mean, w one of the concerns, at least to me, with, with the way that the FCC is going about this is if, if what they ended up doing was merely regulating net neutrality or regulating 
I mean, apparently regulating net neutrality, that might be okay, but the theory that they're using is so broad that it seems like it would really give them sort of unbridled ability to regulate the internet generally. And that's really scary. So even if you think net neutrality is great and you totally want regulation that would ensure that, you don't necessarily want all the other collateral damage that could come from the FCC deciding that it's going to start doing other things. And I mean, we've seen the FCC in the past try to regulate indecency on, on the TV, for example. Um, would not want to see that happening on the internet, for sure. Yeah, so if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. <laughs> or they can, they can keep using this, uh, this uh, justification to do other things. Exactly. I think one of the other, and I'm not the law, obviously I'm not the lawyer, one of the other provisions that the FCC maybe secondarily is relying on is there's sort of a, a deregulatory provision that's to, that the FCC is supposed to try to get out of the way to, spread, to promote broadband um, and, that, and that they're sort of using that as a regulatory rather than deregulatory. Uh, right. Yeah, whatever. Yep. They're, they're charged with, um, with promoting broadband or information services to, throughout the country, and I think they're piggybacking on right. one little thing that right. Congress said and saying, oh, well, that means you know, we can regulate the Internet instead right. of something that's very broad just to make sure that people... Um, to make sure that uh, the information systems continue to, to go forward. Excellent, yes. Okay, so um, net neutrality definition, not really sure. Um, definitely concerns about the process uh, and whether the FCC is sort of exceeding their authority. Um, on this next slide, I have a, a, a number of what people, it, what the press or whatever, you know, some people have, have talked about as potential net neutrality violations. So what I wanna do is talk about each one of them and then have the panel maybe discuss um, what they think about it. Uh, is it a net neutrality violation? Is it something that, the, that potential net neutrality violations should take care of? The first one, which I already mentioned is um, is the Comcast and BitTorrent traffic. So if you remember back about three or four years ago, um, I think the Associated Press had done an investigation and some other people had done an investigation and found out that um, Comcast was inserting reset packets into a BitTorrent traffic so that, um, that you know, the torrents were slowing down or not completing. Uh, and this, I think, was probably the first big, you know, big media look at net neutrality in terms of of, of a violation. So let, let's talk a little bit about what Comcast did. Does that violate sort of the principle of net neutrality? And, and is, there, is there a way that net neutrality regulations could fix something like that? Well, well, let me start off with myself. I'll say that I think it's certain, what they were doing is certainly a violation of the principles of net neutrality. I mean, they're sort of interfering with traffic, interfering with the protocol. I don't know that, that regulations could fix that, but let's, let's see what the rest of the panel says. Just to, back up, just to back up one step, just so that you know what the open internet rules say right now is what the, the regulations are. Um, basically, the net neutrality rules, uh, there's four principles, and one is transparency. They want network operators to talk about their practices and their management of their systems and, and give consumers information about what they're doing. Um, internet services can't block legal content. And um, the next principle is no unreasonable discrimination. So therefore, if you're a cable company like Comcast, you can't just say, I'm going to block Netflix just because. And um, an overarching principle, which is the fourth principle, is reasonable network management. So um, an internet provider can actually do some things that's within reason to, ma to manage their network, such as security. Spam. Spam. Um, so I guess with the Comcast BitTorrent case, th these principles came after that case, but before the case, there were some principles that were very similar to it that um, the FCC was relying upon, and it was a policy statement, it was not regulations. Right. But um, what the Comcast and BitTorrent uh, situation, what the courts and what the FCC was focusing on was reasonable network management. And was it reasonable for Comcast to be blocking the BitTorrent stuff? And um, they didn't disclose it. Right. So um, one of the things that's in there that um, Deborah didn't go into is uh, it 
this applies to legal traffic, which when we're talking about BitTorrent should be brought up because a lot of stuff that people do for BitTorrent could be, um, although maybe not criminally illegal, uh, there could be civilly illegal. Um, yeah, I actually I want to add to that point. Uh, it's really interesting to me that the FCC rules don't actually necessarily prohibit or, or they, they create loopholes that might have allowed what Comcast was doing. Um, and that's interesting because FCC, of course, tried to go stop Comcast from doing it. Uh, the, rule, the rules say no unreasonable discrimination. It's not clear. I mean, the, there's a specific section in the, in the order that says, you, um, while, it, while it's not forbidden by the order, uh, pay for prioritization is probably not okay. So you look at that and you say, okay, well maybe then Comcast couldn't do what it was doing. But there's also a loophole in there for uh, any, any reasonable efforts to address copyright infringement. Mm -hmm. So if Comcast had merely said, oh, well, you know, this was our reasonable effort to address copyright infringement because we happen to believe that, you know, a certain percentage of the traffic or a large percentage of the, tra the traffic on BitTorrent is copyright infringing, then it actually might have been okay under the FCC order, which is, I, I think, one of the significant loophole concerns. I also think oh. interesting about, uh, about the, the four principles that she said is that the, the, both the third and the fourth one use the word reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I talked about this in my previous talk on, on the Fourth Amendment, which has the word unreasonable, is that, is that what does that mean? Mm -hmm. yep. Reasonable is, and, and I, I, yeah. I use this, I don't, I don't even know who the quote belongs to, but the, the, it's been said that reasonable or unreasonable, it might be the most litigated word in the history of, Ameri in the history of America. What is reasonable and what is unreasonable? And two of the four principles use that word. So, so certainly, um, you know, these principles are, they're interesting, but they're certainly, they're destined for the courts. Sure, and, and actually in the open internet order, the FCC specifically says that with reasonable network management, it's gonna be case by case. Right. Like they give some examples as to what that could be, but they say it's case by case. So it's not defined, right. and that's, that's gonna be a problem. <laughs> so in this case, it's like obscenity, and um, as far as these regulations, uh, how do other things tie in, like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act? You know, when you're talking about doing reasonable things to prevent illegal activity and the other laws that are in place that are a bit, could be controversial, and you know, the things that big corporations effectively have for shutting down traffic. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. It'll, it will encourage certain behaviors that might be over, overreaching or overbroad in terms of stifling traffic and activity where the law might otherwise actually provide some protection. Question. Wow. Several. Um, <laughs> first off, the point about reasonable, unreasonable, uh, legal, illegal. Once you define legal, then everything else is illegal, which is great because they can make anything they want legal as long as they think of the kids and then everything else is illegal. Second, reasonable It's like and unreasonable, it's like being a little bit pregnant. I mean, let's be honest here, that's what they're saying, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, third, uh, those were statements, forgive me. Third uh, question, why the hell are we talking about? And, and my question is this, we're talking about just American net neutrality. The, the, you know, a significant portion of internet traffic is outside of our borders, outside right. of our control, outside of the FCC. And we have the arrogance to think that we control it all. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about it? <laughs> wow. Well, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of uh, studying up on the inter international views, but I think that, um, I think that it's more open across, across the world. But one of the things that I did see in the FCC order and one of the dissents to the net neutrality rules, one of the commissioners brought up the fact that, look, America is a leader in, in the internet and in, in, in innovation with the internet. Well, that's what she said. That's what she said, okay? That's what she said. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if they're gonna, if, if, if the FCC, if this is in the dissent, if the FCC is gonna go ahead and regulate this, what kind of a, what kind of a role model are we serving to other countries, um, because that could be dangerous too, because then they have their own rules, and where are we gonna be then? I mean, check me on this. In South Korea, they get, what, 100 gigs to the house? But uh, I mean, the point you raise is, is a good one, a good and that point. is, what we're talking about regulating is only part of the internet. Yeah. The traffic that's in the United States. What about traffic from Europe to Japan, or, and, and how does, any of our stuff, can we, can we regulate that traffic if it transits the United States, I even mean, if it's not, I mean. 
at, at B-Sides, and forgive me for mentioning it, but we were handing out zero bank cards. Mm -hmm. And the zero bank cards gave you $400 with a free VPN out of Iceland, Germany, Japan. Uh, it, they, you have a dozen, dozen different choices, including the US, a couple of them. But I mean, so now that traffic is going encrypted across and gone. And how does that affect net neutrality? I mean, so as more and more people go to encrypted VPN traffic, right. how is that going to affect, or is the legislation going to give a crap about right. it? And that's another question. Let me, walk, let me just walk through the rest of these violations, and then we'll start, you know, we can start talking about them individually. Um, no, 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 no problem. Um, how many of you have mistyped a domain name and instead of it just not appearing correctly, you got your ISP search page with maybe some advertisements, right? I long for the days when that brought up porn sites. Um, <laughs> so Verizon has done this in the past and there's a lot of ISPs that do this now. You type in the wrong thing and instead of just not resolving and giving you an error, you get uh, maybe you were trying to search for this or maybe, and it's a certain, well, some people have suggested that your ISP, um, by doing this, is sort of messing with the DNS protocol, and that's a net neutrality violation. Um, uh, let me walk through these all. Well, actually, we... I, I want to speak on that go, really quick. Go for it. Uh, I've got some strong feelings on this. Uh, this all started out in 2005. Um, VeriSign, who effectively owned the domain name system for years, rolled out this concept where if you know you typed in something that didn't resolve they brought up the ad pages and at that point because they owned it and well because they owned the infrastructure and any DNS stuff had to go through them um, I was firmly against it that was breaking DNS DNS might be a sketchy protocol you know Dan is always talking about it he's in what track two or something right now um, but you know it's one of those things they were breaking it in this case well, you're getting a service from your provider, and if they're going to redirect it, that's kind of a contractual thing. You can use other DNS providers. You don't have to use, um, you don't have to use the one provided from you. I know I haven't for years. So, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I agree with Todd on that one. I don't, I mean, I have some problems with it. Or I certainly, I, I think it requ requires some transparency that may solve the problems. Uh, I don't see it as a net neutrality issue. And partly I think it's nice to keep the, those net neutrality issues discreet because there may come a day when there right. really is some kind of regulation. So let's, let's only affect. Right, the, and, and, and you sort of mentioned the devil's advocate argument, Todd, which was if you're a Verizon customer, you don't have to use Verizon DNS server, right? You could use Google or OpenDNS or so, Maybe it's a technical. I don't know. I mean, you could argue either way. Well, it, it, let's you know. Let's expand that to other services beyond just um, a DNS. Say you don't get it so much anymore, but it used to be you got an internet account, you had an email account that went with it. I mean, the, the concept of all right, you know, I've got an email address and I had a Pac Bell account for 15 years. I paid 20 bucks a month. I didn't connect to them just so I could keep that address and people connect to me. How would those sorts of things, I mean, it opens a whole just big can of worms when we sure. start getting into the services that are available elsewhere. You know, when you get beyond just kind of the, the physical infrastructure, that's right. kind of what the limitation is with a lot of this. And that's my feeling on, okay, if we're going to look at the net neutrality, we need to look at kind of the sure. physical nature of it and those specifics. Okay. Um, uh, a while back, Xbox Live started providing ESPN3 streaming over Xbox Live. Uh, it turns out that some ISPs like Time Warner didn't want to, were blocking it. Has anybody had this problem in the past where you had Time Warner or another ISP and they blocked ESPN3 from Xbox Live? It, okay, maybe one, a couple people. Uh, I'm, we'll, we'll, we'll skip through this one um, just because. What do they show on ESPN3? Is that the dwarf tossing? Yeah, I don't know. No? I don't know. Okay, does anybody have a, this is, this is, this is, I only do this if someone actually has a phone. Does anybody have a Samsung Fascinate? A Samsung Fascinate cell phone. One person. Only one person? Okay, one of, one of the pro, one of, this was another issue that people mentioned. The Samsung Fascinate phone, which the search engine was locked to, to Bing. And is yours, is yours locked to Bing? Okay. That was another issue. If, can, your, can your wireless provider lock you down to using a certain search engine? And whether, is that a net neutrality violation? And then the last one I want to mention, and then we'll sort of, we'll talk, we can talk about any of them, is Metro PCS. Metro PCS is a wireless carrier in Texas, and they provided a couple different 4G plans. One was like a $40 plan that gave you sort of internet and YouTube, 
And then if you paid $50, you could have access to like Skype and, and um, uh, what else, uh, um, Netflix and some other things. So what they were doing was charging more for different types of content, uh, which I think at, at its as principle, most people would think that that's a, a net neutrality violation. Charge, charging people more for using based on the, 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 the type of content. And I actually like to discuss that a lot because it goes back to um, years ago. There, you go back to the beginning of this fancy web thing, and in '95 you had your options. You know, you could have your AOL. Uh, in my case, you know, Netflix was the first company. No, sorry, uh, Netcom, first company that came up with uh, a flat rate actual web plan. But you know, you pay less money and you get a shell account, or you pay a bit more and you can actually use a web browser and you didn't have to do links and stuff. And so, looking at the historical concept. These are similar things. I don't know whether it's good or bad. And then my feeling, you know, I'm not the attorney here, is I've gone back for years on the common carrier clause, and I always thought that was a good thing. I mean, that's kind of the original net neutrality thing, and that basically, from my perspective of managing networks, has been, all right, if I have the capability of filtering certain content and I filter that content, then I'm responsible for what's passing on my network. I mean, the internet is based on a lot of sharing, and so you let other people's traffic pass on your network. If you are filtering that traffic, uh, you're responsible for it. So the pity, kitty porn comes across your network. If you're not filtering it, that's fine. It's not yours. If you are filtering it, that kitty porn, you own that kitty porn, and it's, you know, you're going to federal pound you in the ass prison. And I, so that's why I'm a fan of kind of the common carrier stuff, which we're kind of losing with things not being telcos and the, you know, infrastructure changing and the legal wrangling stuff. Um, well, I guess well, one, one of the things out of all these, um, the net neutrality violations um, that I think we should point out is in regards to wireless with the new open internet regulations, wireless is treated differently um, than wireline broadband services and the commission gives a little bit more leeway to wireless services because they feel like they want to be a little bit more hands-off since it isn't as developed, or so the FCC says, right. um, as a technology. So um, with the four principles, the transparency, the blocking, the unreasonable discrimination, and the reasonable network management, um, wireless companies have to abide by the transparency rules. Um, the blocking, wireless companies have a little bit of a different standard than the wireline companies. Right. I, I believe that in the wireless standards, they can block as long as they're being transparent about it. Is that correct? Um, they cannot block, uh, they can't block lawful websites and they cannot block applications good. that compete with the provider's voice or video telephony services. So therefore, if you're a mobile, uh, broadband provider, you can't be blocking someone else's VoIP service. Right. So in the arena where they actually have more authority, they're doing less, basically. Because <laughs> the wireless bad. spectrum is totally regulated by the FCC. There's no question about that. And it's also all, those are still fall into the category, at least as far as I know, of traditional telcos. Right. So, you know, on a couple levels, they have way more authority versus just the standard internet these days, mm -hmm. but they're doing less. I mean, I guess, I guess what's going on with these rules is one of the, um, the arguments against these rules is let the, market, let the market do this, let it play out. And so the FCC is like, well, the wireline broadband's been around for a while, the market's kind of done its thing, we can go in and regulate it. And as far as the wireless goes, ah, eh, we'll regulate it, you know, just half as, half as much as the, the wireline, we'll keep an eye on it, and we'll see how it, how it, how it works out. And they don't want to stifle any innovation there, yet these regulations don't stifle them innovation in the wireline. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't buy that distinction. Yeah. I mean, plus, like, if, you're, if you want to increase competition, which in theory they, they do, wireless is the area where we have none of that. Um, and particularly if this AT&T T-Mobile merger goes through, I mean, there are going to be two companies that own 80% of the market. Um, I mean, it seems to me that wireless is maybe where, where more would be valuable. I mean, it, it needs more, my, in my mind, it, it should have more regulation because it's a far more, you know, limited resource. The spectrum's already been sold, so there should be more regulation because you can't have more competition because, well, you, it's not like I can go out and I mean, it's tough to buy, uh, you know, 
um, a hard line, but theoretically, if I wanted to run over to my neighbor's house and throw some Cat5 over there, it's fine. But you know, the, the wireless spectrum is totally regulated and it's sold, so it you actually, can't really buy much more. Yeah, I mean, there's another interesting issue there, which is tethering. Um, Verizon had recently asked, uh, I, don't, I don't know, some app, some I, either Android or, or Apple to take um, tethering apps out of its app store. And there was a complaint that was filed uh, alleging that um, that was in violation of the open, openness rules that govern that particular spectrum that Verizon was using. I mean, s separately, just a question whether tethering is a net neutrality issue, sort of an interesting one. I'm not sure what I think. Um, I mean, I think tethering should be permitted, but I, I think the question whether net neutrality goes from content to device is, is interesting. The FCC thinks it does. We have about 15 minutes left, so we, we want to save the rest of the time for your questions. I, I, the only thing I ask is that you just try to make your question brief so that we, um, so that we have time to get to as many people as possible. Um, if we run out of time, we, we'll, we can spend you know, some time in, in the, in the uh, question and answer of room, uh, but we want to get as many you know, questions as possible. Go ahead. Uh, mostly it's two brief statements slash questions. First, going back to one of your previous statements where you were discussing the actual service provider regulating the services. If it's per the legal aspect, how are you know, your big three, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, how are they actually able to be blocking Skype if there's actually a law or regulation saying you're not allowed to block service provider? So how are, they, how are they blocking Skype if there's Correct. a regulation saying so? Well, um, these regulations aren't in effect yet. They have to be published in the Federal Register, and then there's going to be 60 days, and then after that they will be in effect. So, I mean, unless, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Abigail, if that's my understanding. Yeah, but I think, it, I, I mean, they will surely be challenged, yeah. and so it could be a very long time, if ever, that we actually see them implemented. So right now, there's nothing. Right, um, right, and, and if, unless there's, um, my understanding is unless there's an official stay and the court grants the stay, the laws will come into effect 60 days right. afterwards. So, but if, if somebody challenges the rules, which they're, they're most likely going to, Verizon tried to challenge the rules and the court threw it out saying it wasn't ripe because it wasn't published in the Federal Register yet, um, then it, I'm sure someone will stay the rules and who knows when. Who's likely? Yeah. Um, and the way they're written, me, if it's my network, I can come up with total legal justification for throttling any traffic I want to. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you have good attorneys and you have good justification and, okay, Skype is causing, you know, unwarranted uh, consumption of bandwidth, you know, it's just, it's unequal, I can't provide the service that I'm contracted to do to provide all of everyone. So that's, that's the loophole I'd go with if I wanted to pull that off and it was my network. Right, and, and, and just to add to that, if, if I'm Verizon or Comcast and I, and I pay to put the infrastructure in, then, then I might have my, my claim that. Well, I, I paid to put this infrastructure in, so why can't I have some reasonable control over what's on it? So and it's a good question. I think, I think what goes to the heart of it is, like you said, the, the, the regulations themselves, whether, the force that they have, because they are, they're going to be challenged, and whether or not, you know, because if, if an ISP blocks that stuff now, there's not really, because the rules aren't in place 100% yet, there's not really an enforcement mechanism in place. Okay. The second question kind of goes more towards the copyright aspect. When you look at things in the past, such as Microsoft, when they came out with, I believe it was either Vista or 7, and the European Union actually stated, you are not allowed to force your browsers only to IE. And they made it so that, you know, you had to offer the services through IE, Firefox, Chrome, etc. At the same regards, can't that be taken with net neutrality? You're regulating your services based on uh, Samsung Fastenate locked to Bing, Verizon locking you down to using their certain services, Comcast, all your ISPs are doing the exact same thing. How are they varying in, as far as their legal regulations? How are they different than Microsoft going out here and doing the same thing with their browsers? Well, that, I mean, that would be another way to attack some of the perceived problems that come from net neutrality, which is to take an antitrust perspective and say, let's try to increase competition here, and maybe that'll improve some of the problems that, the, the fallout that we would see from not protecting net neutrality, per se. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have 10 minutes, so let's, let's uh, try to limit it to one question per, per person so we can get through all of them. Thanks. My name is Josh, and I'm from Seattle. And um, I appreciate and, and uh, respect the panel, and, um, and I, my impression was that most people are pro-net neutrality. 
And in the interest of getting both opinions out, I'm just wondering um, if you guys could elaborate the, um, the opposing argument about, um, in my opinion, um, why, my, why isn't my, um, my dollar, my vote enough to actually cause this to, to uh, affect a change? Um, I worked at a small ISP, um, a couple small ISPs with less than 10 employees, and, and generally we had people come to us because we didn't have any kind of regulation on our, our um, network traffic, and, and I'd like to hear why that wouldn't work in the case of, uh, of certain service providers, you know, throttling different services and people being unhappy with that and going to other ones. Thanks. Um, my feeling on that is the, the last mile stuff is a limited commodity, and in, you know, for a while with DSL it was open. Um, I know in California that was turned around so that you know, uh, for a year or two there was un un unbundled DSL, and you know you can still get DSL through other providers. But then another ruling came through and said, oh no, you know if you want to have DSL. Um, like AT&T can charge you for that. And yeah, that, at that point, it's kind of the last mile sort of a thing. It's, you know, who owns the lines and, you know, if there are tariffs in place so that, you know, there are reasonable rates for other competition, I think it's great. I don't know whether there is anything like that for things like cable. And that maybe someone else can answer that. I'm not sure. I'm I mean, not sure there's, there's a less... Yeah, and that's because um, the government funded a lot of the telephone lines being put in, what, 100-ish years ago, and so yeah, and that's a, a public utility sort of a thing, so they were able to regulate that, which is how the FCC got involved. The cable stuff, they own all of this. So you take a look at Google with their, the, all the fiber they have. Who knows what's going to happen in the next five years with Google? You know, there could be a whole free second super fast internet here, 100 gigs to your door, that totally avoids all the rest of this stuff. You just have to let them sniff all your bits. and. <laughs> uh, my, my, the, I, I, I'm scared of Google, but since I know where they sleep at Burning Man, um, <laughs> and when that changes, then, well, I'll stop using them. Hi. Um, this isn't my primary area, so I was just kind of hoping that maybe you could, could answer a question. Do you know if there is a push on either the congressional level or the international level to provide regulation in the net, net neutrality or to expand the FCC's? delegating authority or is it just going to be a court battle going out on a case-by-case -case basis at this point? There, well, there's been a push on both, on, on both sides, meaning the Republican side and the Democratic side. So the Republicans are trying to get a bill through Congress that would say the FCC can't regulate this. Um, the Democrats are trying to get a bill through saying that they actually have explicit authority to, mm -hmm. um, but maybe bound that authority. And do you know if there's anything on the international scale, just given the international nature of the internet, there's some, inter there's some international net neutrality regulation. I think Chile has some laws. I think the Netherlands does. I think Japan does. Um, I'm more like on a treaty scale, like everybody working together to try uh, to, to regulate. Oh, or, no, know. not that I'm aware of. I think it was mentioned in one of the um, recent EU Commission reports, right. but not positive. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Just to, yeah. Add, just to add that to my, so I, I didn't hear exact, all, everything she said, but be, Generally speaking, Republicans are opposed to giving the FCC power to regulate the internet, and Democrats are, are it, generally speaking, and because the House is controlled by the Republicans and, and the Senate's controlled by, I, I don't think in this congressional session that we'll see Congress give the FCC any additional authority. Right. And, no, I and I, I, even like three days ago when they were dealing with the whole budget crisis, um, I saw some press about some of the senators, some of the Republican senators were, um, I don't know, if, I think they sent a letter to Chairman Janikowski of the FCC saying, you know, you guys need to review these rules because President Obama came out with some kind of speech saying that all regulations that have been passed are about to be passed, you need to make sure that they're efficient, um, and they're saying, hey, you guys have to, to look these over again. So I know that the Republicans aren't very happy with um, what's going on, and there is, there is definitely some pushback there. But um, you know whether or not it's a priority for Congress, it might be a matter that the courts get a hold of it first. Okay, so you guys started a lot with content filtering, but it seems like from an ISP standpoint, they're not filtering content because they don't like YouTube or Netflix. They just don't like the bandwidth suck that it is. And for reasonable network management, yeah, you can throttle some services to give priority to others, but then all bits aren't equal. How? Is the regul how are the regulations going to propose the ISP standpoint of overselling their bandwidth? They offer everybody X number of megabits, but they really don't have the capability to give everybody X number of megabits all at the same time. So if you start using all of your bandwidth, 
then they look at you and they ask you, okay, what are you doing with your traffic and can we shut part of your traffic down because you're creating a problem on our network even though you all are only using the allotted bandwidth that we told you you could have. I think um, I might be able to answer this in the FCC order as far as reasonable network management goes. They say that congestion can be legitimate, um, reasonable network management. So, I, I mean, I think, uh, and I'm not a technical person, it sounds like there might be some kind of a congestion issue. Well, it seems like they oversell bandwidth like oh, airlines you know, it's, oversell flights. It's been happening with cable from day one where things are oversold. And unfortunately, I don't know, I've looked through this briefly. Uh, I haven't read the whole 180 pages yet. But um, when it comes right down to it, I don't know that that's really addressed. And um, I hate to say it, it's kind of one of those contractual things where, you know, as, as you, there's the last mile thing, so we don't really have the competition on the cable side. And, you well, know, not that's... not just cable. I mean, wireless ISPs. With wireless, you know, what, you know and, on any of that. Data first came out, they were unlimited. Now we, we are being cut off. Actually so. no, all right, okay. Yeah. Um, we can I, finish this. We can finish this. For, for, for those of you... Join us for those of you uh, who haven't asked questions, please come to the question and answer room. Thank you to everybody on the panel for coming today, and thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody.